Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study here at Bible Believers Community Church, where the name says it all. And uh, welcome you folks on the internet. We sure appreciate having you. But listen, if if this is your internet church, if you come to church here, kind of like preachers pester their uh, congregation to go out into the community and and um, bring people to church. Uh, you can do the same thing from home. Get some folks together to come to your house and sit down in front of your large screen TV and <laughs> come to church together. Amen. So if you enjoy our messages, please hit that like button. Boy, it sure helps with the algorithms to get the word spread. And also share it with somebody that you think it might do them so good and subscribe to our channel if you haven't subscribed yet. We sure appreciate you joining us. We, uh, we look forward to meeting together in the air at some point in time, amen? amen? So with all that being said, we're doing an expository study on the book of John, the gospel according to St. John. And so if you will turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10 and verse seven, John chapter 10, verse seven. And uh, I guess I gave an update for the last couple of weeks saying I've been one week off of coffee, two weeks off of coffee. Well, I went three weeks off of coffee and now I'm drinking a little bit of coffee again. It's not that uh, I couldn't stand it because I could, but it was kind of a challenge. Somebody said, if you go off coffee for three weeks, you're gonna feel so much better that you're not gonna wanna go back to coffee. I went off for three weeks didn't feel the slightest change and i truly enjoy coffee so if you see me with a cup of coffee don't say he fell off the way and um it's by design i went for the three weeks didn't feel a change and so now i'm back I, I, i'm reducing it significantly i think that lisa and i both committed to no more than three cups a day and that's a big change for Lisa. She is drinking like three gallons a day. <laughs> so she likes her coffee. So John chapter 10 and verse seven, it says, uh, then said Jesus unto them again, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sh the sheep are not, Seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Verse 13, the hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for this evening. We pray for your blessing on this message and that you would just guide and direct it the exact way that you want it to go. Help me to teach those lessons that your sheep need. Help me to give them the food that's needful for them to be healthy in the spiritual walk that they take and the journey that they take day in and day out. Lord, we love you. We praise you for all that you do. Put a watchman at my mouth that I don't say anything that's incorrect or wrong. And uh, Lord, we just love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're talking about the door. The name of this uh, message is Jesus, the door. <laughs> The door and we've been talking about the door last week we looked at uh the words jesus said and how they fit today's political they how they don't fit today's political politically correctness or political correct agenda jesus was and still is discriminating nothing's changed jesus excludes the entire world from salvation with the exception of one group of people has nothing to do with race or gender or or uh, ethnic background or anything like that. It has to do with whether you confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that he rose again the third day. So he discriminates, he does, he is a religious discriminator, okay? He discriminates against any religion that teaches anything other than salvation by grace through faith in him. And so uh, Jesus was and is discriminating. 
He is the only way. Anything else, according to what we just read, is thieves and robbers. Amen. And so today, we live in a day where you don't, if you don't toe the line, if you don't fit in with what they see as being right, you get canceled. <laughs> uh, YouTube does it, has done it to me once with a threat that if we do this three times, you're out forever. They, they, if, if you don't fit their agenda, what's there? There is anything that's not Christian. <laughs> Progress in society is getting as far away from the Bible as you can. That's progress in the lost world society. And so if you don't fit their way, if you don't see things the way they see it, if you don't talk in the way they want you to talk, if you don't join the banner of political correctness, they'll cancel you. And, and you can say, wow, that's just crazy. I think it's always been that way. Look, they tried to cancel Jesus. They killed him, right? He didn't speak the language that they wanted. There wasn't an internet where they could, you know, use social media to get people to avoid him or whatnot. They did everything they could to get people to avoid him. They did everything within their power. They told their, their congregation, if you're associated with him, you're going to be kicked out of the synagogue. They did what they could socially to, to cancel him. And then eventually they said, none of our social attempts are working. We have one choice left and that's to kill him. And that didn't work. And so uh, social media platforms, whatever they want, they can do whatever they want to do to try and cancel me. And they may be able to get me off of their platform, but in the end, I'm gonna stand up with Jesus in glory. Yeah. And they're not gonna cancel me. They're not gonna do it. So, um, you know, talking about this whole deal of political, political correctness a couple weeks ago, uh, and I, I watch football, I watch professional football, I don't watch college football. Um, a lot of my friends who used to watch professional football with me don't watch professional football anymore. They only watch college football. but. One of my favorite commentators is Tony Dungy, former head coach of the, um, of the Indianapolis Colts. And not only is he a former head coach, but he's in the NFL Hall of Fame. He's a for, former player as well. And Tony is a professing Christian. And a news report came out, and, and, and I'm sure that, that uh, um, Tony was fed up with the political correctness that's going on in the world today, especially when it comes to gender identification and using whatever pronoun somebody wants to go by. And he made a post on his own personal social media account. And what she said, words to the effect, I don't know the exact words, I don't have an exact quote, but what he said was words to the effect of some schools are now placing cat boxes in the restroom in order to accommodate everyone on what they profess themselves to be. Now, it, it was satire. It was sarcasm. And uh, the funny part of it is now NBC, that's who he's a sports commentator for. They're talking about firing him, getting rid of him. He didn't fit our agenda. He doesn't, he didn't toe the line. And, and he didn't say it on their network. He said it on his own personal social media platform. And to me, the funniest thing about the whole thing is the news is reporting that they're thinking about firing him over it. They said what they, they, they gave the, the exact quote of what he posted on his online uh, uh, personal um, multimedia agenda or whatever. They, they quoted it verbatim. And then they said, after they quoted him, they said, which turns out not to be true. <laughs> how, how ridiculous. Tony wasn't literally saying that they're putting cat boxes in the restrooms. He was giving some satire on how far astray this world has gone, but they can't even live with that. Recently, I watched a uh, 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 broadcast by Glenn Beck, which I thought was a pretty good one. And what he was talking about is the left has no sense of humor at all. The right wing they not only laugh at things that are funny, they laugh at themselves when they do something bonehead. And, and he pointed that out and he was talking about 
uh, interviews that were done with comedians, and comedians tend to pick on the right wing a lot more than the left. And, and a lot of them were asked, why do you pick on the right wing? And the answer I found a little bit amusing. They said, because the right wing can take it. I mean, they laugh, they think it's funny. You, you say those kinds of things about the left wing and they get all hurt and bad feelings and you know start going after you and all that stuff. And that's, anyway. Enough about that. Sarcasm, folks. That's my primary language is sarcasm. I get it, right? English is my second language. Sarcasm is my primary language. And I got it from my mom. <laughs> so I guess free speech in America is pretty much gone. And you know, when you talk about news networks and businesses that fire somebody for something they say, that has nothing to do with the First Amendment of the Constitution. A business has the right, in my opinion, to choose who they want to work for them as a representative of their company. And if you say something that doesn't line up with the, um, the values of a company, they should have the right to let you go. That has nothing to do with free speech, but this free, the, the, the whole, I, that whole concept of a company has a right, et cetera, it's gone way too far. It's gone way too far to the point where there is no such thing as free speech in America. So anyway, Jesus wouldn't be tolerated in today's society. There's the point. <laughs> Jesus would not be tolerated in today's society. All these people who preach tolerance, the, all the folks that talk about, we need to be tolerant, we need to be tolerant, 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 tolerant. And they're not tolerant at all. What they mean is, is you must tolerate what, I, what we say you tolerate. We mu you must tolerate any evil thing that we perpetuate. You must tolerate it. And if you don't, then we're not going to tolerate you. That's, in essence, what they're saying. And, and um, when you stop and consider the things that they want you to tolerate, guess what it is? The Bible has a name for it. It's called sin. <laughs> They want you to tolerate sin. They want you to tolerate a woman's right to kill her baby. And not just in the womb, folks. Uh, some states that are trying to take this thing as far as they can take it are now saying that you can kill a baby after it's born, a natural birth, and after it's alive outside of its mother's womb, if the mother doesn't want to have a child, she can just say, ah, kill it. I'm okay with that, just go ahead and kill it. So it's no longer the, the and it was alive from the get-go, it's no longer just a blob of cells that's not really alive because guess what? The minute that baby is conceived in a womb, it is a life, it is. And so it's not just that, it's, it's all kinds of sin. You gotta embrace the LGBTQWXYZ, NBC, ABC, <laughs> CNN uh, plus uh, agenda, and I don't. You know, the quickest way for me, if I'm watching a program for me to, uh, I remember Lisa and I were starting to watch a new series that came, it's not new anymore, it's probably several years old, but when it first came out, it was called, uh, it's, a, it's a hospital show. And we watched like three episodes of it, and we thought it might be a pretty good show, but then in the, the either the third or the fourth episode, we, we didn't get very far into it, they had a scene where, two guys were married and kissing each other on the set and we're done. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put up with that. I'm not, as I said, you can make homosexuality normal. What does normal mean? Normal means that society accepts it. You can make it normal and they're doing their best. The media, um, the, the, and they're now churches are getting on board. God forbid churches are getting on board with that whole nonsense. It's sin. It's sin. You didn't hear that? It's sin. Now, it's not worse than adultery. It's not worse than... For sin is sin, amen? amen? It's not worse than taking the Lord's name in vain, but it is sin, and we don't want to tolerate it. One of my best friends in the world, man, he's a good Christian man. I love him. And... Uh, he gets around somebody, and maybe it's somebody you don't know. They, they drop a couple cuss words, and he just says, hey, you know, 
if you're going to talk that way, then I'm going to step aside because I don't wish to communicate with you. Um, I, I don't talk that way. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to. And you say, well, that's not very tolerant. Amen. <laughs> Jesus wasn't very tolerant. <laughs> and we're not supposed to be tolerant of sin. We're supposed to um, push it away. We're supposed to stay away from it. We're supposed to uh, avoid sin. But they want us to embrace and love sin, not just the sinners. I mean, it started in churches gone on with this cute little phrase, you know, hate the sin, but love the sinner. <laughs> but it's gone past that because you give the devil an inch and he wants a mile. Amen. And so it's gone well beyond just uh, uh, love the sinner and hate the sin. Now it's Love the sinner and love his sin. Embrace his sin. Let him or her be what they want to be and you just tolerate it. Well, that's not the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're going to be Christians, Christian literally means Christ-like, then we don't tolerate it either. We need to, as a corporate group, start disassociating ourselves with any programs that promote homosexuality or any other sin for that matter. Um, if you're the type of person likes action films where they portray the bad guy to be good and the good guy to be bad, you need to start weaning yourself of that. That is not good. Look at Isaiah 520. Isaiah 520. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Bible says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If you like those shows where they portray a bad guy and the good guy's catching up with them and you're feeling like rooting for the bad guy, oh, he has to get away, he has to, he has to get loose or whatever, the Bible says, woe unto you. You're putting evil for good and good for evil. That's what you're doing. And so, before we get too far down that wrong path, let's get into today's message. And you say, well, it's kind of late to say before we get too far down that path. We're down that path. So, we're, talk we're talking about how the sheep will, last week, we were talking about how the sheep will hear the voice, how they will not hear the voice of a stranger. They'll hear the voice of the shepherd but they won't hear the voice of a stranger. And we're gonna take a, a talk about that a little bit after the next phrase that I'm gonna give you right now. Uh, to see this next phrase I wanna talk about, you'd have to look up, you're in John chapter 10, look up to verse four of our text. It's something that we've already covered. It says, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him and they, know his voice. They know his voice. And so they know his voice. Now, I've never been a shepherd before, so I don't know a whole lot about sheep. I've been around sheep. I've seen sheep. I was in, uh, listen, I, I was raised a country boy. I was a member of FFA, Future Farmers of America. And I had a pastor and I had the dad let me take care of. We raised cattle, we raised horses, we raised chickens and ducks. And, and uh, some folks think because my career at some point took me to large cities that I'm a city boy. I'm not a city boy. I, I can live the city life. I can live wherever God puts me to live, amen. But in my heart, I'm a country boy. And I've never been a shepherd, but I've been around sheep. I've been around sheep when they've sheared them. I've been around sheep when, when they're um, um, doing all the things that you do with sheep. I mean, you only want so many rams. And so they, you know, they do the same thing with sheep as you do with bulls. You make them steers, but they don't call sheep steers. But I don't know a whole lot about sheep. I, I know a little bit, enough probably to get me in trouble. But they know the voice of their shepherd. Now, things may be different in an Americanized environment where you just put sheep out in a field. Now, not all sheep are raised that way. Some sheep still have shepherds that hang out with them. 
uh, Lisa and I, when we go to um, the Amish community, there, there was a guy that they were paying to move his fence around to keep weeds uh, ate up with his sheep. And I think those sheep knew his voice and I think they'd follow him. So they're not going to respond to the voice of anybody else. Now, shepherds have said that the only sheep that respond to another's voice is a sick one. If one gets sick, they might listen to the voice of somebody else. So, so, um, and that says a lot about Christianity, I think, today. There's sick Christians that are listening to the wrong voice. How did they get sick? Well, they start off by getting anemic because they don't read the Bible, which gives them the power for the spiritual warfare. And, and if they don't read the Bible, then, then they become sick, they become anemic, and then they can listen to the voice of somebody else instead of the voice of the shepherd. Now, Jesus used this terminology by design and on purpose because the audience that he was speaking to was an audience that Israel had always had sheep and shep being a shepherd was part of their hard wiring. They knew all about sheep and how to raise sheep and how to take care of sheep. And um, so when he's given these analogies about I'm the good shepherd and the sheep hear my voice and here's something that I, I've learned about sheep, not from my own personal experience, but from others. Uh, matter of fact, there was a, a, I got this specific illustration from another preacher who happened to go to Israel. And he saw this big area where all these shepherds were bringing their sheep into a common area where they were all intermingling. And it was for the purpose of giving them water to drink. And that's the same practice that took place back in the Old Testament. You see where they, the different shepherds bring their sheep in to give water. And this guy, this preacher uh, guy that I knew, he was... He was watching this whole thing and he went and he started talking to one of the shepherds and he said, do you ever lose any sheep this way? And the guy said, no. He goes, well, they're all mixed up. He goes, yeah, I know it. And he goes, but, but how do you keep yours separated from theirs? He goes, I don't need to. And he goes, what do you mean you don't need to? And he said, um, when I'm ready to leave, I have a call that I give and my sheep will come to that call. And he said, well, tell me the call and I'll call your sheep. I want to see how this works. He goes, it won't work that way. And he goes, what do you mean? And he said, my sheep know my voice. And the guy immediately thought about this portion of scripture. And he said, let me know what your call is and how you do it. I want to do a test. And the guy told him his call and where he had inflections in his call so that he could mimic his call very, very closely. And the guy mimicked his call and guess what? A few sheep looked up and then went right back down to grazing. But none of them came to him. And then the shepherd gave his call and guess what? All of his sheep came to him. His sheep knows his voice and they will not follow another. So many sheep are responding to other voices. They must be either, I can, I can think of a couple possibilities. One possibility is they're sick, they're anemic because they don't read their Bible. You know what's gonna inoculate you from following the wrong voice? Get in the book. And get in the book with a heart for truth, not get in the book so that you can find something new and then straighten everybody out that's been wrong for thousands of years. <laughs> Amen. And so um, get in the book, be open to, the Bible says, don't let anybody move the ancient landmarks. There are ancient landmarks of teachings that have come down through this Bible that are accurate. And you move those landmarks, God's not happy with you. God says, don't lose, move those ancient landmarks. And so um, uh, 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 the sheep's either sick or they're not really a sheep. That's really the only two options that I, and, and there's probably more, but that's what I see. Christ bride, which is the church, Christ's bride knows his voice. Look at Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 10. Song of Solomon chapter 2. So you got Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Songs of Solomon. So Songs of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 10. The Bible says, my beloved spake and said unto me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. That's the rapture of the church. 
That's Jesus talking to his bride. Rise up, my love, and come away. In verse 12, the flowers appear on the earth. That's why I always say the um, rapture most likely is going to take place in the springtime. It's going to take place in the springtime. And not necessarily the springtime of where you live, <laughs> Because in different places of the world, spring and some places, winter is flip-flop from summer, our winter months or their summer months, etc. Springtime of Israel. Springtime of Israel. Uh, the flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green leaves and the vines with tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret place, places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is com comely. And so that's speaking, that's a bride replying to the Lord Jesus Christ. Your voice is sweet. Your your um, countenance is comely. And so the bride knows the voice. <laughs> and when Jesus calls you, if you're born again, if you're a true, not just somebody who goes to church, not just somebody who's, who reads their Bible, not just somebody who prays. There's a lot of lost people that pray all the time. There's a lot of lost people that read their Bible. If you're truly born again, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you're going to hear that voice when he calls and you're going to arise and you're going to go and his voice is going to be sweet to you. Man, I can hardly wait. I don't know. You know, I think I personally think the rapture is going to take place in my lifetime. I'm looking forward to it. But my faith is not shaken if the rapture doesn't take place in my lifetime. The one thing I know is if I go by the undertaker and not the upper taker, one thing I know. I'm still going by the upper taker because the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together to meet them in the clouds. And so, folks, I'm looking forward to it. We have Christians today who listen to voices of demons and would swear that it's the Holy Spirit that's talking to them. And they're listening to the voice of a demon. Based on what my studies have shown and what I've just been teaching, they're either sick or they're not Jesus' sheep. Jesus says they will not hear the voice of another. And so probably if I was to lean, if you say, well, which is it? Are they sick or are they not uh, Jesus' sheep? I'd probably lean toward not his sheep, but I can't make that call. Uh, there could be other reasons, I suppose. I never have once claimed to have all the answers, never once. I've never gone up in front of you and say, hey, whatever you wanna ask, ask me, because I have all the answers. Never once did that. Um, but certainly those two would apply. I don't think just because somebody's misled by a foul spirit automatically means they're lost. It could just mean that they're spiritually sick. They're weak. They didn't take Paul's admonition to put on the armor of God seriously. Mm -hmm. And it could be that they're a babe in Christ that's been listening to a demon for decades. And now what's the difference? It's the, it's the voice that they recognize. And so today's Christians, folks, I hate to say it, I wish it wasn't true, I'm embarrassed by it, but today's Christians are, are weak. Today's sheep are weak, they're sick. And, and they, 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 they get more food from a, a brainwashing, um, agenda-setting news media than they get from the Word of God. That's just the reality. If you're watching network news on a regular basis, my strongest recommendation I can give to you is stop it. <laughs> They're brainwashing you. They're trying to convince you that sin is okay, and it's not. They're trying to get you to toe the line and do what they want you to do. And what do they want? They want a one world government. They want a one world religion that excludes Jesus Christ because he is not tolerant. He is discriminatory, and they don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. They want another, a one world government that just worships a higher being. 
There's plenty of higher beings that I don't want to worship. The Bible says that we were created a little lower than the angels, which means every single angel is a higher being than us. And guess what? A third of those angels are fallen and want to lead you astray. Wow. How sad. Sick sheep can be misled sheep. That's just sad. Today's sheep cannot stand a rebuke. I heard a story of a deacon who, was approached, who approached his pastor and said, Pastor, according to scripture, you're supposed to feed the sheep, not beat them. Jesus said, if you love me, feed my sheep. Now the pastor just smiled and said, yes, but if the sheep are dead, there's only one thing left to do, skin them. <laughs> And that might be a cute little story. It might be funny. It might make you laugh. But the premise of the story is completely taken out of context. It really, truly is. Jesus did say, if you love me, feed my sheep. But Jesus said a lot more things than if you love me, feed my sheep. The Bible also instructs the pastor to reprove, to rebuke, and to exhort You'll find that in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Think about those commandments. A preacher is supposed to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Two of those are negative. A reproof and a rebuke are negative. At least in the eyes of the person receiving it. It's positive because it's trying to get you to turn to Christ. But Christians aren't going to put up with that. Today's Christians won't take it. If you make a habit of reproving and rebuking, your congregation is going to make a habit, habit of leaving and never returning. That's my experience. Um, I have countless. I don't even know. If we had everybody that came here saying that God led them here and came here that initially said how much they love the ministry, if they were all still coming, would be in a building program because this building wouldn't be big enough to house them all. But the reality is somebody will come here and they say, man, the, the Holy Spirit has been pestering me to come here and come here. Some have told us, man, I've resisted it for six months, but the Holy Spirit just won't leave me alone. This is the place I'm supposed to come. And the first couple of lessons, they go, oh my gosh, I've never got Bible teaching like this before. And then I'll have some message where I'm rebuking the church and they never come back. <laughs> they never come back. So going back to John chapter 10, verse 9, it's referring to the rapture and the second advent. Let's look at it. Uh, John, I'm in Song of Solomon. I got to turn back myself. John chapter 10 and verse 9, the Bible says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Would you go turn on the lights? The lights are not turned on. And it's getting hard to read my Bible. Thank you. I appreciate it. And so that's referring to uh, the rapture and the second advent. The rapture is where the Christian enters in. And if you study the return of Christ, you're going to find out that we're going to be entering in and going out. That you also have to be saved in order to get in. Plus, the only way you can enter in is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Very good. Thank you very much. Now, in verse, the, verse 10 has multiple applications. And uh, let's read verse 10 real quick. Let me get a drink of water. My dog's tail's thumping. It says, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That has multiple application. And here is a great example. I know many would call the scholars saved man, and I don't think I can go that far. I can't say that most of the scholars are saved. I can't say they're lost either. First of all, I, you're not given a license to say that person's lost. I, I've watched their behavior and the way they behave. A Christian just wouldn't do those kind of things. Because I'm telling you, we have crit, sick Christians. <laughs> and Christians would probably do just about any evil thing that you can find a lost person doing. And so you don't have the license to judge the heart of a person. And, and, and there's a flip side to that coin. 
not only can you not judge if a person's lost, you also can't judge if a person's saved. Jesus said there'll be wolves in sheep's clothing. They're gonna look like Christians, smell like Christians, taste like Christians if you're a Christian eater, but they're not gonna be Christians at all. And sometimes you can recognize folks that you should be skeptical of. You never judge them and say, well, that's a wolf in sheep clothing, but there's keys that there's clues that they give that should at least make you skeptical. For example, man, today's lesson was really good, but <laughs> I really love the pastor, but the pastor's a okay, but his wife, anything like that, anything that's gonna start tearing away or causing division or casting doubt or, or making somebody uh, feel less apt to join in wholeheartedly, I'm not saying that person's lost, but boy, oh boy, you gotta be careful with somebody like that. You gotta be careful what friends you pick. You really do. Um, I can give biblical examples that tell us that we need to be very careful of the friends that we pick. There's so many people that get in trouble following the advice of their friends. So I won't say that those scholars are saved and I won't say those scholars are lost. God doesn't give us a license to judge if someone is saved or lost. That's his business. It's not our business. Our business is to tell the truth. Our business is to preach. Our business is to give an account for what it is that we believe. That's our business because our business is the Lord's business. But when it comes down to saying, well, it never took with this guy, that's not your business. That person over there can't be saved. That's not their business. Uh, man, I know this guy's saved. That's not your business. It's not your business. So um, that's precisely why I stress over and over again the, the whole concept of self-examination. I, I, I can't tell you whether you're saved or lost, but you know what? If you do self-examination and ask the Holy Ghost to reveal to you, I believe the Holy Ghost will. If you want to know if you're saved or lost, if, you, if you've questioned it, if you've doubted it, First of all, my advice is, is, is twofold. If you're doubting your salvation, you think you got saved, but man, you're just doubting it. Ask the Holy Ghost to, to show you the truth. That's, that's one piece of advice that I'd give you. The second piece of advice that I'd give you, go through the, the act of salvation right now. You know, I know guys that have supposedly got saved, you know, a dozen times. And I'm not saying that they get saved, get lost, and get saved again, and get lost again, and get saved again. Listen, once you're saved, you're saved. But anytime they had a doubt, they would just go back to that altar of their heart and say, Lord, I give my life to you. Lord, I, I, I believe that you're God, and I believe that you rose again the third day, and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. You make a prayer like that, and you're saved if you mean it. Now, you can say those words and not mean it, and I can give example of example of example of people that have said those words and not meant it. A perfect example, I, and it's a really good one, is church camp. When a, a good message is preached and a guy's there, a kid's there that's lost, and all of his friends said, you need to go down there and take care of it. And they go down to get their friends off their back. They didn't go down and got saved. And it doesn't matter how they prayed. <laughs> they didn't get saved. You, you got to get lost to get saved. And peer pressure will not get somebody saved. You got to get saved because you recognize you're going to hell. And the only way out is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's salvation. So if you're doubting your salvation, go back to that altar of your heart. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, your God. <laughs> Believe in your heart that God raised him the third day. Make him your savior. Take it beyond simple belief of, yeah, I believe that he did that to, oh, he did it for me. And I'm relying on it. That's where it goes from simple belief to faith. Do that and get saved. So, uh, I stress self-examination over and over and over again in this ministry. And people say, why? Because it's a biblical concept. Look at 2 Corinthians 13, 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Second Corinthians chapter 13, 
in verse 5. The Bible says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. You know what that tells me? There are some folks who are walking like they're in the faith, but they're not in the faith. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Now, people say, I don't understand that last phrase. I'm going to explain it to you, okay? So here's what we're supposed to do according to 2 Corinthians 13.5. We're supposed to examine ourselves. We need to look for evidence within ourselves that we are in the faith. What kind of things are evidence? Good works are evidence. Uh, bridling your tongue is an evidence. Doing good toward the ministry that you're part of is an evidence. Now you can do all those things and not have the faith in yourselves but you're supposed to look for evidence that we are in the faith and we need to prove it to ourselves. You don't need to prove it to your preacher, to your spouse, to your friend, to your Sunday school class, to your church. You need to prove it to yourself, to where you're comfortable with it. We need to know that Jesus Christ is in us. I know he's in me, and sometimes it's embarrassing because sometimes I drag him places that he probably wouldn't want to go. <laughs> Amen? If he's not, then we will be reprobates and castaways. You know, prove your own selves. Know ye not yourselves that Christ is in you? If he's not in you, then you're a reprobate. What's a reprobate? A reprobate is a castaway. That's that group that Jesus is going to say at the judgment, depart from me, I never knew you. That's good religious people. It's, it's the Catholics that went faithfully to mass but never accepted Christ as their savior. Um, it's the uh, Mormons who thought that someday they were gonna be a god. Spoiler alert, that seems to be a popular saying anymore. Spoiler alert, you're never gonna be a god. Never, 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 never. You're not a god. You're not a God today. You, won't be a, you weren't a God yesterday. You won't be a God tomorrow. You won't be a God a million years from now. You will never be a God. There is one God. Amen. And that's all there's ever going to be. So, believe me, I'm not just saying this because it's good words to say. I examine myself all the time. Even as a preacher, I still examine myself. God has sent people to help me with this, to help me examine myself. He has put people in my path that have created me looking within myself, saying, where am I in my spiritual walk? Um, I've been called by people, I, I've had people say, you're lost. There's no way that you're truly a saved, born again Christian. I've been called the Antichrist. Yeah. <laughs> I had one guy send me an email, he referred to me as the Antichrist, and from that point on in his letter, every time he addressed me, he said, Antichrist Day, because my name's Jeff Day. And so, Antichrist Day, you this, 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 Antichrist Day, you this, 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 this. I've been told I'm not saved. I've been told that I'm not called to preach. I've been called a deceiver. I've been called a lamplighter. I, I, I could probably spend all day telling you all the different names that I've been called, but that's the devil using people to discourage me. That's my conclusion. And, and I don't say that lightly because anytime somebody says that, I take it internally and I examine myself. Am I really called to preach? Am I doing this in my flesh? And the answer for that one's pretty easy because I wouldn't do this in my flesh. This causes more pain and anguish than you can even possibly imagine. It's, and that's just a reality. You get hurt, people hurt you. If, if I was to choose a vocation, it would not be pastoring a church. And really for me, it's not a vocation because there's no money coming in here. This church doesn't pay me. <laughs> it's not a vocation. And I'm not an amateur either. I'm called of God. I'm not a novice. And so every time somebody says that, it's the devil trying to discourage me. It is God also calling, listen, the God, God uses the devil all the time. He called uh, uh, the king of Babylon his servant and the king of Babylon was always his enemy. <laughs> and he called him his servant. 
And so God's using these people to get me to look inside myself to see if there's some wicked way that needs to be addressed. And it's also the devil trying to say, give it up, boy, quit. You shouldn't be doing this, stop. Because the devil doesn't like what I'm doing. So what's the point? The point is we're supposed to examine ourselves. When I point my finger at a scholar, I'm not calling them any of those things that I've been called. I don't look at a scholar and say, they're the devil. I don't look at a scholar and say, they're the antichrist. I don't look at a scholar, I hope, I, I can't think of a time that I've ever called a scholar a name. I hope I haven't. Because that weakens your statement. Um, I just try and point out the truth. And I actually pray for them to examine them, themselves. And, and uh, truth be told, some are on the other team actively working. Some scholars that say they're Christian scholars, they're actually on the other team actively working for Satan and they know it. You say, who are, who are those ones, preacher? I don't know. I already told you we don't have the license to judge their heart. I don't know which one of them are working for Satan and knowing it, which ones are working for Satan in ignorance, or which ones are just sick sheep that have made scholarship their God instead of the Bible, amen? I don't know. Which one is working for Satan? I don't know. And knowing it, I don't know. But they're there. I know that they're there because the Bible tells us that they're there. Uh, I know that Satan is an infiltrator. And I know that the Bible tells us that this will happen. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 12. 2 Corinthians 11, and verse 12. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 12, the Bible says, but what I do, that, will, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false prophets. See what God's saying about folks? There's gonna be false prophets. For such are false prophets, deceitful, Work, workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. You know, there's a church today that says that there's 12 living apostles that govern their church. That's a lie. There is no such, the, the concept of apostolic succession is nowhere to be found in your Bible. The closest you can come to finding it is when Judas Iscariot committed suicide. Peter told the group, the Bible said, let another take his bishopric, which is his office. And so they cast lots to see who would replace Judas Iscariot as a 12th apostle. Now, I've heard arguments that, I think they picked Matthias, and I've heard arguments that Matthias never really truly was an apostle because that's a God called position, not a cast lots position. And that person that replaced Judas Iscariot was none other than the apostle Paul. I'm not gonna go into that discussion today. Do your own study on that and see what you come up with. But the reality is, that's just like saying that person's lost or that person's saved. You don't know. God could have uh, influenced the lots to where Matthias was the 12th apostle, and that would make Paul the 13th. <laughs> but from that point on, there is not one, and there were apostles that were dying. There's not one example in scripture of succession where they passed it on to another, except the initial deal with Judas Iscariot. So the Mormon church has 12 false apostles, and Jesus in our text calls them thieves and robbers, amen? Isn't that what he said? So what did the so-called self-professed scholars steal from you? Because I said it has multiple applications. These false scholars have stolen some things from you. One thing, one thing they've stolen from you is your Bible. They've stolen the Bible from you. And uh, today's Christians on a very large scale don't believe for a minute that they have the absolute true word of God. They don't believe it. They handle it flippantly. They handle it like it was just some holy man that did their best to tell us what God wanted out of us. And that's not what the Bible is. Um, we're gonna talk, we don't have time to go into this topic, but we're gonna pick up with this next week when we're gonna talk about these false teachers and things that they've stolen from you. 
And so let's end with a word of prayer. Lord God, we do thank you for the, your word. We pray for your blessing upon it. We pray, Lord, that you would just guide the hands of people that need this message, that they'd find it on the internet, and that they'd listen to the entire message and not cut it off, and that you'd just penetrate their heart. Lord, that you, we live in such a wicked time of wicked sinners and wicked Christians even, Lord. And God, I pray that you use this message to start prying open some of those eyes of blind people that they can see, that they turn from their wickedness and turn from their evilness, and that they'd start serving you in truth. And Lord, that they'd, that they'd get grounded and that they'd li listen to good Bible preaching, that they'd get some thicker skin and be able to take a rebuke and a reproof because you command your preachers to do that. And so if we talk about preachers who are called of you, Lord, and I look at all the preachers that are not reproving or rebuking, I don't think it lines up with them being called of you, but I don't know that for sure. We just pray that you'd intervene. We're in these last times and we know, but that doesn't mean there can't be a pocket of, of um, revival. I know there's not going to be worldwide revivals. Your word says there's going to be a falling away, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a pocket where some folks start getting their lives straightened out and right. Help us, Lord. Help us and help us to love you more and more each day. And we do love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.